Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I must start as one Aussie to another to say thank you to George for his magnificently well-tempered and illuminating speech. Thank you, George. It's my very great pleasure to have been asked to make this award to my close friend and colleague, Tom Harris, Executive Director of the International Climate Science Coalition. Now, a few words about the ICSC. First, it is one, and perhaps the most important one, of a number of similar climate science coalitions scattered around the world, and other branches include New Zealand, Australia, and the USA. In addition to Tom, as director of the um, international uh, unit based in Ottawa, Can Canada, we have the directors of two of the other units, Steve Gorham for the um, Climate Science Coalition of the US and Barry Brill, the director of the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition. I know they're in the room, I don't know where, but I'd like them to stand up and give everybody a friendly wave so we all know who they are. Where are you? Uh, Steve over there, and where's Barry Brill? Is he not here? Okay. All of the climate science coalitions have similar roles, and that can be encapsulated by the words of the mission statement of the, the New Zealand, which was the oldest climate science coalition, which reads, our mission is to represent accurately and without prejudice facts regarding climate change to provide considered opinion on matters related to both natural and human-caused climate effects, and to comment on the economic and socio-political consequences of climate change." End of the quotation. The first Climate Science Coalition was established in New Zealand in 2006 by the wine industry executive Terry Dunleavy, known to many people in this room, and his, uh, his colleague Terry, uh, sorry, his colleague Brian Leyland, who is a well-known power uh, electrical engineer who owns his own small run-of-the-river hydro station in New Zealand. The ICSC was established two years after the New Zealand branch, and it followed uh, 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 the attendance of, um, of Terry Dunleavy at the first uh, Heartland Conference on Climate Change in New York. So as ever, uh, Joe Bast and the Heartland Institute were in the mix. After he'd attended the, uh, the meeting in New York, uh, um, uh, Terry writes here to me, uh, after co-founding the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition in 2006 and attending Heartland's first uh, international climate conference in New York in 2008, I realised the need for an international coalition. Three international phone calls assured me of pleasures of funding necessary to pay for a full-time executive director for three years. Tom Harris, Canadian, was recommended for the position and it has proved to be an inspired choice. An inspired choice indeed. All of us have seen the results of Terry Dunleavy's original action. Of course, and as I'm sure Tom would be the first to agree, Today's award, therefore, reflects also on the keen judgment, commitment, and enthusiasm of the two Kiwis, that's slang for New Zealanders, uh, who set up the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition, thereby paving the way for Tom's appointment as the executive director of its international counterpart. Neither of them are here, but I wish to call for a round of applause for Terry Dunleavy and Brian Leyland. Now, of course, this is all about Tom, not uh, Terry and Brian. So a few words about Tom. He trained as a mechanical engineer and project manager at Carleton University in Ottawa, completing his bachelor and master's degrees there successively in 1975 and 1977. His subsequent professional experience has included acting as a science and technology advisor to Bob Mills, the former opposition environment spokesman in the Canadian Parliament. For two years, in 2009 and 2011, Tom taught a very well-received undergraduate course at Carleton University. Uh, over 1,500 students attended, and the course was entitled Climate Change and Earth Sciences Perspective. Thereafter, and indeed before that, 
Tom became established as a media and public communications communicator on science and technology matters, especially on the dangerous anthropogenic global warming issue. Tom's encyclopedic knowledge of the topic, quiet confidence, friendly demeanor, and his dignity of presentation now place him in the very top category of successful science and technology communicators, especially on the electronic uh, airwaves of radio and television. Here is a recent letter published in the Californian which will give you the taste of Tom's style. Michael Gerson wrote a letter to the paper citing the national academies of more than two dozen countries support the idea that a majority of scientists agree that human emissions of carbon dioxide are causing a climate crisis. But none of these organizations have demonstrated that a majority of their scientist members actually support the Academy statements. The declarations are simply the politically motivated opinions of the executives of these official science bodies or small committees appointed by the executives. A more realistic overview of scientific opinion, writes Tom, is derived from the reports of the non-governmental International Panel on Climate Change. Therein we find listings of thousands of peer-reviewed references from the world's leading science journals, many of which demonstrate that dangerous human-caused climate change is highly improbable. Yet, he continues, 94% of the $1 billion a day spent worldwide on climate finance is dedicated to trying to stop a climate change that might happen in the distant future. Only 6% of the available money goes to helping vulnerable people adapt to climate change today, however caused. This is effectively valuing people yet to be born more than those suffering now, a situation that is clearly immoral. That letter encapsulates Tom's style perfectly. It is a beautiful letter, and I'm delighted that the editor of the newspaper saw fit to publish it. Now, in presenting Tom with his award today, I do have one regret, and that is that his father is not here to enjoy the occasion. We all know the saying, like father, like son. And having had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Harris Senior, I have no doubt at all as to the origin of many of Tom's skills and high character attributes. So if he should be watching the webcast of this meeting, hi, Mr. Harris and my congratulations on the fine achievements of your son. As Terry Dunleavy writes again from New Zealand, in spite of funding being a continual struggle after the initial three-year uh, donations ran out, Tom has maintained a stream of factual, down-to-earth commentaries across all media forms, exposing the fallacious propaganda of anthropogenic global warming alarmists who base their claims on unverified computer projections that are increasingly and utterly contradicted by real-world observations. All signatories to the International Climate Science Coalition are proud and happy that Tom's dedication to climate truth has been so fittingly recognized by this award. Tom, I realize the road has been long and sometimes arduous. But the overall reality is that your hard work and skill in presenting information to the public about the realities of climate change are paying off. You are making a difference, and increasingly so. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with very great pleasure that I now give you Mr. Tom Harris for the Award of Excellence in Climate Science Communication. Wow, <laughs> what do I say after that? Jeez, better just sit down now. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Uh, there are so many really exceptional climate science communicators out there. People like John Coleman, as you heard this morning, and people like Christopher Monkton, you know, just blow out the house. Mark Morano, Tim Ball, there's just so many people out there that I was really quite floored when I got uh, the phone call that I was, in fact, to be the first recipient of this award. 
You know, in, um, one thing people don't realize when they see me on television or on radio is what I did in the hours before the interview. I was off, I'm almost always on the phone with Dr. Ball because <laughs> you get the call, you know, basically, oh, can you tell us about sea level rise, you know, in the Maldives or can you tell us about polar bears in the Arctic? And yeah, I have a good knowledge of that, but I, you know, someone like Dr. Ball, who's of course one of our advisors, is really essential to my success. I mean, basically, in, in many ways, I'm the talking head for many of the scientists that are in our groups. You know, I'll contact uh, Professor Morner from Sweden, for example, when I have to talk about sea level in, in the Maldives or whatever. So when a person like me gets the award, it's really the many, many scientists who have crammed the knowledge into me in the hours before my interview that allow me to do that, okay? So they're, they're really critical. And that actually is the first three people that I have to really thank. Um, for actually allowing me to do the, the kind of things I do. I just regret that I'm 61 and I'm only now realizing, hey, I should have started this 25 years ago. <laughs> However, it does give you a perspective on life when you do a lot of different things. The first person I want to thank is Professor Tim Patterson. He has been a speaker at previous IEEC events. Uh, he's a paleoclimatologist, a geologist at Carleton University. Tim was the one who turned me from a rather passive alarmist, I wasn't terribly excited about the field, to a very strong skeptic. Okay? Tim, Tim Patterson is the one who did it. He took an article that I wrote in the, in the Ottawa Citizen in which I referenced uh, you know, how the conditions on Venus might very well happen on Earth because of the CO2 buildup. And Tim used the article in his course because he liked el other elements of the article, but he told them, but no, what happened on Venus cannot happen on the Earth. So I thought, who's this skeptic, you know? So I called him up and he says, yeah, come on over to my lab, you know? He was very friendly. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't the traditional right winger. He drove his bicycle to school and he had a long bushy black beard at the time. Uh, but he showed me the proxy data that basically showed that the sun is almost certainly the primary driver of climate change. I still didn't believe him. He gave me lots of references. But you know, within six months, he turned me around. And we wrote our first articles together as joint authors for the Ottawa Citizen, uh, who now will not publish this because they've drunk the Kool-Aid completely. But Tim Patterson really got me going. And after that, it was Tim Ball. Tim Ball now is my major source. He, as I said before, he's the one who schools me rapidly. I, Tim, Tim, I got an interview in 23 minutes. You know, it's on the voice of Russia, and I got to know about this. And he tells me. So, you know, to a large extent, people like him, and now also Bob Carter as our chief scientist, chief science advisor for the ICSC. These are the people that are cramming the facts into my head and uh, allowing me to do the interviews. There, there is, in fact, two other people I have to thank. First of all, Terry Dunleavy, who founded the ICSC and actually got me on board in March 2008. I really, Terry gave me a pretty long leash, okay? He, he would give me guidance here and there, and at first I was under contract to him, to him and the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition, but he really trusted me, you know, and, and that I really appreciated, and I think it paid off, I hope. <laughs> but Terry is the first non-scientist I have to thank. The other one is, is a kind of interesting fellow, a guy called Dr. Holly Black, who has absolutely nothing to do with the climate field. But in 1990, I took a course on how to get your writing published. This was at Algonquin College in Ottawa. And he said, no, no, don't write a letter to the editor. Do a little research and submit an op-ed. Write an opinion piece, OK? You might even get paid for it. So I wrote my first opinion piece. It was on the Voyager flyby of Neptune in 1989. And I talked to him. I said, well, you know, where should I send it? To maybe a little local newspaper? He said, no. What would be the best newspaper in the whole world to publish your piece? I thought, well, JPL, they're the ones who run the Voyager program. So yeah, the LA Times. I said, well, what about the LA Times? He said, yeah, send it to them, see what they think. Well, guess what? They published. And it was really pretty amazing because they also paid me $250. And from then on, I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, you write on these things. You can get published. And if you have some good science knowledge and reasonable writing skills, you can get in the paper. So although the LA Times will not publish me now, <laughs> Um, the fact is, Dr. Holly Black, thank you very much for telling me to just submit to the top, because that was obviously the way to go. Anyway, that's all I have to say. I really appreciate it, and I recognize there's many people in the audience that I've learned from, both communication and the science, so thank you.
Congratulations. Thank you. We have to post the cap.